Thank you to all the wonderful speakers here at TEDx Calgary in this amazing virtual event. Uh, and as mentioned, uh, I am uh, looking at how a industry, how an entire group of physicians are currently being disrupted, and that group is a group of psychiatrists. I am a psychiatrist, and it took me many years to become a psychiatrist. And what I want to talk to you about today is how I do not believe that this profession will actually exist in anywhere near its current form at least 20 years from now. I think it's undergoing a significant amount of disruption in a way that we have never seen a medical profession go in any sort of disruption. Now, there's a couple of numbers I'm going to use to back this up. But before I get into those numbers, I want to tell you a little bit of a story about where I'm from. Uh, and the picture that you see is a very small town. Uh, that is a town in the middle of the prairies, in the middle of nowhere, as they say. And I'm very proud to be from this community. One thing I noticed growing up is that this is a very cohesive town. Uh, we had a number of festivals. We were all gathered around sporting events. And I knew this town of about 1,000 people was a very close-knit community. It was, however, not without its challenges. We had a number of individuals, two that I can remember specifically, who seemed to be ostracized from the community, who were very othered from the community. And I think it was like this because they had mental health issues. There was one individual who I remember, uh, I think I would now uh, say, probably had a diagnosis of postpartum depression, something we know is a very treatable condition, postpartum depression, something very biological. This uh, young lady had a child. Before she had that child, was a very functional member of the community. After, I remember, uh, she was no longer a functional member of that community. For many years, she was treated very differently because of her mental illness, and I carried this with me. At the age of 10, I saw a young man who walked differently than everyone else, who talked differently than anyone else. And I soon realized that he actually thought very differently from other people. And uh, now looking back, I think he had a condition that I would call schizophrenia. These two individuals have been burned into my consciousness because I carried them with me, always looking to get them the care that they wanted, that they deserved, that they needed, but could not get because of the mental health stigma that existed in my small town and because of the lack of access to medical and mental health resources. There was no family doctor for many years growing up. There was definitely no psychiatrist in my community. So I became a psychiatrist. I got into medical school. I did years of undergrad to get there. I worked very hard throughout my residency and uh, finally came back and got my dream job. And when I stepped into this dream job, within a couple of weeks of getting there, I realized that I was stepping into a very broken system. And that brings me to my first number that helps me realize that we are in a system of mental health disruption right now. And that number is the number six. That is six months that people had to wait on a wait list to see me. And I thought this was incredible. I thought that this was a very odd system, that I was a power broker of a system. If you had a certain type of mental illness in my community where I practice right now, you had to wait six months to see me. And if you were on the wait list and I was sick and I couldn't come to work that day, you had to wait a number of months to come see me where I could rebook you in. That was incredible to me and very discouraging. And I talked to many of my mentors and they said, yes, Ryan, you will have a six month wait list for as long as you practice psychiatry. And that is the system that we live in. This is very discouraging me, for me. And it also reminded me of something that I heard the old folks in my town talk about for many years. And uh, that was something called the telephone operator, a position that we no longer think really exists. The telephone operator in my town first got kicked off in 1917. And the old folks in my town would often talk about the telephone operator. Uh, and in a lot of ways, this position was like the current day psychiatrist. If you wanted to communicate in my small town of 1,000 people, a large farming community, you had to pick up your phone, dial their number. They had to connect you, literally make a connection listen to you, have some emotional intelligence, connect you with another individual. If they did not show up to work that day and they got sick, you could not make a telephone call that day. Very similar to my position as a psychiatrist. This is a very expensive system to set up. Uh, I was told it cost about $38,000 in the early 1920s to set this system up, which is an incredible expense at that time for this small farming community. I also know that this system underwent an enormous amount of change. What they would tell me, the old folks in my town, was that 
You needed that human touch. We never thought it could change. We never thought this system would be disrupted because you always heard you needed the human touch. You needed that emotional intelligence of the telephone operator. Well, we all know how that telecommunication industry was disrupted. And in the 90s, 1950s and the 1960s, uh, we saw an enormous disruption in this industry with something called the automatic telephone system. And what happened there was a number of individuals designed this system where you did not need the human touch, where you could take the power out of that single power broker. And it incredibly disrupted telecommunications. And the number that was most astounding to me was in the 1950s, there was 480,000 telephone operators. At AT&T alone in the U.S., 480,000. Today, there are only 12,000 telephone operators in all of the U.S. operating today. So we can see by giving people technology, trusting that they'll use it, giving them the right technology, I can tell you that this industry has been disrupted, and I think this is where we're at with psychiatry right now. There's another corollary here, and this is of our telephone use. And the next number that I want to talk to you about that absolutely blew my mind uh, was something uh, that my, my niece, who is a very bright, athletic young lady who just got into college, and uh, she's recently uh, started her, last, or her first semester at college. She told me that in the last six years, she has sent 1.6 million messages on Snapchat in the last six years. And this is normal. She said uh, this is probably average to maybe a little below average her friend group. This is an incredible amount of messages sent in six years. And it really illuminated for me that this is how young people communicate. Now, you may think this is somebody who is addicted to their device. And I would argue that this is just simply how people communicate nowadays. So no matter how we shift mental health, no matter what we think of mental health and the way it's delivered, we must admit that this is where young people are and we need to bring them the resources that are available on a mobile device. This is the way the world is going and it's quite simple. There's another number that I want to talk to you about today that really punched home the message for me that the world is changing and I am amid a disruption in mental health and psychiatry and the way psychology is delivered similar to telecommunications in the 1950s and the 1960s and I want to first contextualize this number. Everything I just told you about, the number six months of a wait list, 480,000 telecommunication operators for AT&T, now 12,000. The third number, 1.6 million messages sent by a healthy young person uh, communicating with her friends. That was all pre-COVID, and we now know what happened with COVID. Overnight, literally, a digital transformation happened overnight and we saw what we'd otherwise think was 10 years of brewing change happened over the course of 10 days and now that we're in the pandemic we've seen a number of important learnings and for me there is one important number that I've taken out of this and that is 48 and that re represents a percentage of US citizens last year who went to the family doctor they did so over a telehealth platform the year previous the number was 11% so think about that. Half of the people who are visiting a family doctor are doing so now using a telehealth platform. That means to me that we are seeing people access care, access mental health and medical care in a way that we never have seen before. These four numbers really slapped me in the face in the last three years when I've been thinking about my job, when I've been thinking about how do I access, how do I bring care to those two individuals that I saw as a young person become totally ostracized from my community? How do I use technology? How do I use the learnings that we've had through COVID and this digital revolution to bring mental health to absolutely everyone? I believe it is through a mobile device. And I'll tell you, there's statistics. There is mounds of research to show, for example, that you can reduce generalized anxiety disorder through use of certain applications. For those who have insomnia, there's mindfulness applications that can help. We've recently seen research on schizophrenia and using digital platforms to reduce auditory hallucinations. What we thought was a very biological condition has very psychological underpinnings where we can help people with chronic and severe mental illness using the latest and best technology. So I'd like to leave you with a couple things. After the disruption in my personal brain about how the world has changing and how the digital atmosphere is changing psychiatry, I'd like to leave you with a couple of challenges on how we can think about this. The first thing I want you to think about 
is simply what are the things that you do on a day-to-day basis that empower your own mental health? What are the things? Are they sleeping routines? Is it using cognitive behavioral therapy? Is it practicing mindfulness for a couple of minutes a day? What are the things that you use to empower your own mental health? I want you to think about that. The second thing that I want you to think about is what would a world be like if we didn't have psychiatrists, if we didn't have psychologists, if we didn't have this very specialized, very expensive role? What if we could imagine a world like they did in the 40s and 50s without that telephone operator? What if we could imagine a world that did not have psychiatrists and psychologists? And how would we replace that role entirely with a mobile technology that we currently have access to today? That is the future that I want us to imagine. That is why I think my role as a psychiatrist that took me 10 years to train for, I do not think will exist 20 years from now. That is the world that I want to live in, and I want to help create with you. Thank you.